now it's time to start our colloquium. And today we have a pleasure to host Kiri Horak. Very good. <laughs> well, it's in a language we should be more familiar with, but it's something tricky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay. So he's working in the Institute of uh, Astronomy, the Czech Academy of Sciences. And today he'll have a talk about time frequency quasi periodic oscillations and oscillations of accretion data. So, and the floor is your also screen. <laughs> Thank you very much. So the title is already announced, and this is the outline of the talk. So first, I will spend some time with introduction, like what it is, these high frequency quasi periodic oscillations and so on. Then I will talk a few words about simple modeling of this phenomena. And then I will go to the main subject of this talk, which is basically oscillations of thin accretion disks. Right. But, but 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 could you kindly tell us what is QPOS? QPOS. Yeah, well, whatever is the pronunciation. I will tell now exactly. Okay. Just now I am to this point. Oh. What yeah. acronym means? Ah, okay. QPO means quasi QP periodic O oscillation. So they are kind of this abbreviation. But they are usually observed in system which we call low mass X-ray binaries, which uh, is basically like in the beginning it's ordinary binary star, but then one star is more heavy than the other star, so it evolves more fast, and then uh, soon it will appear in this final state when it will develop either black hole or neutron star, and then the other star start to flow on this. Uh, heavy component and because it has some angular momentum uh, it first forms some kind of disk which we call accretion disk and uh, in this disk uh, the angular momentum is transferred from the different part of flow so in the inner the uh, medium has so low angular momentum that it can accrete to the black hole or neutron star and uh, the uh, the angular momentum is just transported away like uh, to more distant radiate and uh, since uh, black holes are quite uh, extreme objects then uh, the speed of the uh, of the matter very near to the black hole is comparable to speed of light and uh, there is serious shear and this shear is also kind of leading to big uh, frictions although it's mostly given by turbulence and uh, this friction uh, kind of cause big heating of these disks so very close to this compact star compact object inside uh, the temperatures are really high so the disks are radiating mostly in x-ray like x-ray mostly and um, so if you observe this system in different wavelengths, you basically observe different components of this system. And if you observe this system in X-ray, you observe like the very vicinity of the black hole, which is kind of quite useful when you want to learn something about strong gravity, then X-ray is the right window to use for that. Now, if you if you uh, kind of trans uh, get this radiation, uh, you will see that it's variable, and uh, then you can do, for example, Fourier analysis of this. Uh, you you will get some something what we call light curve, like how intensity change with time, and uh, if you do the full Fourier transform and uh, make the absolute value and square it then you have something what is called power spectra and uh, it basically tells you uh, variable uh, how much variability at different frequencies contribute to the total variability right so basically uh, you get something like that and uh, when you see some peak it tells you that actually there is like x extensive variability close to these frequencies and typical power spectra of these systems look like you have some kind of broadband noise but then on top of that sometimes you have like a little bit coherent or sometimes even uh, really coherent 
uh, oscillations, which are not absolutely coherent. That is why that it is called quasi-periodic and not periodic. Uh, and these are basically QPOs. And uh, there is like huge phenomenology about this. So uh, this is like power spectra of typical low mass XA binaries. So you see these QPOs at like uh, some fractions of hertz, but uh, you see also like uh, some distinct features uh, at high uh, frequency tail of this power spectrum and this low frequency uh, features are called low frequency quasi periodic oscillation and these high frequency features are called high frequency quasi periodic oscillation so high frequency quasi periodic oscillations are some kind of more or less coherent oscillations that you observe around frequencies of hundreds of hertz and now if you calculate like what is the orbital period very close to the black hole and so this gives you like characteristic time scale. So it's kind of comparable with this like one over this characteristic time scale. Of distribution of the frequency is really by So you have a you have a bunch of the observed high frequency QPOs and then nothing. And then if you go to the curves and supers with a bunch of low frequencies, is it really be more or do you have some kind of a continuum? As far as I'm not observer, so that's the first thing. But uh, as far as I know, I think that uh, they, they are really kind of bimodal. That you don't see many like uh, like for example, you don't see that one frequency is greater and greater, and start, suddenly it start to be high frequency QPOs. They are more or less kind of distant, distant features. So this is the typical power spectrum. So on the left is black hole. Uh, on the right is neutron star, right? So basically differs on the uh, nature of the compact object inside this accretion disk. And uh, they are a little bit different in neutron stars. These high frequency QPOs are much stronger. They are so strong that you can observe them like with simple analysis even, and you can even track how uh, the frequency change in time. But in the case of uh, holes, uh, they are very kind of fine. They are uh, difficult to observe, and observers have to do all kind of tricks to find them. So, for example, they observe long light curve, then they cut it to several segments. They do power spectra of individual segments. Still, they don't see any QPOs, and they kind of add them together, like average over this sample of segments, and then because of this uh, randomness, this kind of going away, then they have good enough statistics to see, uh, see them finally, right? So, so they are a little bit different. They are much more coherent in case of neutron stars and less coherent in case of black holes. There is also another interesting thing, and that is that in case of neutron stars, as I told you, you can kind of track the evolution of these QPOs with time. And what is quite interesting that they are following, so there are two, like uh, as you see, there are mostly two, two peaks. And if you follow uh, their evolution in time uh, and you, you draw it in this picture, like one frequency uh, versus the other frequency, they are following basically more or less the same track which is quite interesting um, because it tells you that it must be something like... Uh, it's like three over two overtone harmonics or something like that? I will go to this uh, very soon, but in, uh, in, in case of neutron stars, like uh, the, they are really changing. Neutron stars are here like the, uh, the, the color points. And in the case of black holes, which we call sometimes galactic micro, Quasars because there is like big black holes. It's micro quasars. Actually, these systems which kind of um, share a lot of properties with this quasar, but they are only rescaled uh, with mass. And uh, so, so we, these are like uh, the 
binaries with black holes and uh, they are mostly following the same line which is exactly this 322 so somehow the in the case of black hole we observe frequently the frequencies uh, the qpos which are having more or less fixed rate uh, fixed frequency and these two frequencies are in 322 ratio i will concentrate mostly on black hole case okay, so this is how how typical power spectra looks like you see that there is not very kind of big statistic right so far i think uh, they observe only six sources with these high frequency qpos uh, so so basically you have like several power spectra for the same source and like the blue and red uh, curves differs uh, according to hardness of the of the radiation that you observe and uh, you see that for example in this case this is kind of iconic so you see that you have two peaks sometimes in the ratio of three to two like four 450 hertz versus 300 hertz right? and what is quite interesting is that actually these frequencies seems to be stable there are uh, I, I don't now remember which system it was maybe already this one uh, that uh, they obs uh, they observed these QPOs first like 15 years ago um, and uh, uh, and they found these frequencies then during this time of 15 years the source was doing all kind of things so for example uh, you know these these uh, systems are variable so they, they are going through different spectral states then suddenly there is like so-called quiescent state where there is no too much radiation and people think that probably there is not accretion disk at all and then the accretion disk develop again uh, going again through basically similar spectral states and once it was observed after these 15 years again and they observed the very same frequencies which suggests that probably these frequencies reflect something uh, much more stable than like uh, what is the current temperature in the accretion flow but it must be really something probably given just by strong gravity this uh, is also supported by this observation where uh, people found or it was Remillard and McClintock mostly uh, that uh, they they draw on the one axis the frequency of this QPO in different black hole system and on the other axis they put the mass estimate or mass measurement which you kind of can infer from the binary period and this kind of uh, ordinary Newtonian spectroscopy so so in this free system you have two you have QPOs and you have also like mass estimate and it seems that they are kind of very nicely following one over m scaling and if you hear about one over m for frequencies then you immediately go to uh, something what we know from general relativity and that is that in GR as you know everything is dictated by mass of the of mass of the black hole right so basically if you have two black holes then you can observe similar phenomena but uh, all the lengths and times are just scaled with the mass and right? it's kind of obvious so so for example for like typical unit of time is given by this this kind of dimension no, analysis no it's nothing nothing difficult uh, which which gives you this and all these important radii are given just by kind of multiples of this kind of characteristic length scale gravitational radius and uh, characteristic time scale right which is like this so for example you have like some special radii marginally stable orbit um, which is uh, related to the frequency orbital frequency which is given by this and if you would have some phenomena which is occurring at the marginally stable orbit then automatically you have this one over m scaling right? there are also other kind of typical scales but I'm not going too much to details and uh, some people 
we are trying to kind of extend this one over m scaling uh, like on the broader range of masses so they were for example looking to some agns and so on and see whether they would see some kind of variability and at the frequencies which would correspond to this frequency of certain uh, galactic black holes and uh, it's kind of still discutable but uh, nevertheless the paper is published so so there is some evidence that you have like some analogical phenomenon already like over much broader range of masses so this is like shown here you see that it's quite impressive it goes over over nine decades of uh, uh, in terms of mass so it's quite nice so uh, the question is how to how to explain this and i will talk about two models one is very simple and the other one is rather complicated so i will start with this simple one uh, and uh, basically the simple one is not model it's just based on a very simple observation and that is that actually if you have orbital motion then uh, one would think that uh, to orbital motion you have like uh, uh, is characterized by single frequency right and it's basically how much it takes uh, for the particle to go to the same place right but actually uh, in um, this is in Newtonian gravitational field but in more complicated gravitational fields already in Newton but if there are some uh, like quadrupole components and so on then uh, this is not like that and actually in general case there are three different frequencies and uh, one is orbital frequency and the two other two are so-called epicyclic frequency and the epicyclic frequency is uh, if you have like a particle moving around on the circular orbit and then you kind of imagine that you slightly perturb the particle so it will of course go outside right and the question is whether this particle will ever return back and uh, the the answer is that in Newton and gravity of course it will come back and uh, this kind of uh, excursions from the circular orbit uh, is related to some frequency and this frequency is called epicyclic frequency in the same way you can perturb the particle vertically right and then the question is will, will it go back to the equatorial plane and the answer is yes and this uh, this kind of is related to so-called vertical epicyclic oscillations right so you have basically slightly non-circular orbit you can describe by strictly circular orbit plus small oscillations around this orbit and this this is called epicyclic oscillations and then they are related to some frequency which is called epicyclic frequency and of course in Newtonian case all these frequencies so this kappa is the radial epicyclic frequency the, this uh, omega perp is the vertical epicyclic frequency this omega k is Keplerian frequency the frequency of the orbital motion and uh, somehow in Newtonian gravitational field they are equal this is well known fact already to Kepler right that uh, the particles are moving around the or planets are moving around the sound sun on the elliptical orbit so first of all this orbit is planar it's planar ellipse and uh, therefore you have to have per one revolution one orbit you have to have one complete vertical oscillation otherwise you will not finish in the same place and you will not be in the orbit or in the in the plane and also we know that the real orbits are elliptic so they are close so it means that you have to complete one oscillation per one revolution to appear again in the same place right so that is why all these three frequencies are the same but of course uh, uh, in the case of strong gravity it's not like that so for example in the case of Schwarzschild black hole the orbits are still planar right because it's spherically symmetric space-time therefore the vertical frequency is the same like the orbital frequency but the radial frequency is very different can be very different and difference of these two frequencies give rise to the peri astron precession right this uh, that mercury uh, mercury perihelium peri is 
slowly changing and that is why uh, because uh, uh, if you make one complete cycle in the radial direction you will make more than one cycle in the in the azimuthal direction so the pericenter slightly move right so that is the that is this and uh, in the case of strong gravity this radial uh, frequency can go even to zero and below this uh, radius uh, it becomes imaginary and this is well known fact it goes to zero at marginally stable orbit and below all the orbits are unstable uh, with respect to radial perturbations and in the case of if you have rotating black holes then you lose the spherical symmetry so basically you have something like that and all the frequency can be very different so for example you have also some precession although in the vertical case like we have this periastrum precession right so uh, if you if you will think about these two uh, basically what it tells you that the orbital plane is slowly like precessing and this is so-called lens steering precession right so basically you can you can describe all these well-known phenomena using just uh, uh, epicyclic frequencies which is when you talk about slightly not circular orbit is quite useful useful tool no and uh, so the very kind of simple idea how to explain these oscillations comes from Stella and Vietri and they just said okay so uh, let us suppose that uh, these different different uh, uh, frequencies are uh, caused by some blob moving around the black hole and uh, just kind of we observe some combinations of these typical frequencies of the orbital motion so they basically say that uh, the upper free, upper kilohertz qpo this one which is like free it's free to do so this which correspond to free is given just by the keplerian frequency the lower one is basically the periastrum precession frequency like this combination and then they even say okay but then we can even identify one okay kind of from the low frequency qpos and it will correspond to this this is of course assumption right there is no no a priori reason that it should be like that it's kind of we assume this and then we will see what happen and uh, in fact if you write down all the formula from general relativity then you find out very quite nice fact that uh, you have three, you observe three different frequencies and you have three announce right one is kind of mass of the black holes the other one is spin of the black hole and the third one is uh, is the radius where the blob is orbiting right so basically you can solve these three equations and you can measure the mass of the black hole spin of the black holes and where the blob uh, is moving and they did it in case of this uh, black hole this is a strange number and uh, and they found out actually quite they measure the mass and spin and they are kind of not very far away from uh, what is observed by different techniques right so so that is kind of nice on the other hand the problem is that you can ask a lot of questions about that so for example how the spots are produced right so why why i should have there some blob like what 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 cause this blob to appear there then why frequencies QPO frequencies doesn't change in time right so I talked to you about this black hole which is observed after 15 years and they have the same frequency so it means that uh, somehow the blob must be at the very same point like 15 years ago that is like it's me even more interesting than QPOs probably if this would happen right so so that is of course not answered by this model why they are in uh, rational ratio why there are these three to two so of course here you don't have any answer to that right? you can think about some resonances between but it's something in addition why we observe only these combinations like this periastron precession and the orbital uh, frequency and not for example the radial frequency itself right which is somehow related to the question how the how the radiation is modulated right from this and uh, there are of course several 
several works already about that, that for example they assume that I have some blob which is is kind of radiating and then they they make this ray tracing right how the photons are coming us and they uh, generated the uh, the light care right and they analyzed it and they found out that actually it's not like that, that these combinations are, of frequencies are so so common actually the radial uh, frequency itself kind of pop up very much in this then of course uh, the, this is like physical question uh, if you have spot mm, it's it seems that it's very difficult for the spot or blob to kind of be alive in the accretion flow because this accretion flow is re very very much shearing you have big radial gradient of the velocity and it's shearing like it's not easy to survive for this blob if they are not somehow really rocky like for example asteroid would probably survive that but uh, like if you have just some fluid configuration then uh, the shearing would be serious and therefore you would observe much uh, much wider peak right it will be much more dumped and uh, this is not compatible with the observation and so on and so on so all these questions are kind of uh, still unclear and uh, that is why this model is kind of mostly accepted by observers when they want to measure uh, black hole mass and black hole spin if they observe these QPOs. But uh, but uh, I think one cannot take them too much seriously. So there is another idea which is related to a different approach. So at the beginning, I was talking about some blob which is kind of moving around. Uh, but uh, the other idea is okay maybe these QPOs are somehow connected with some collective phenomenon right so I was talking about that there is this accretion disk so maybe maybe uh, these oscillations somehow correspond to the oscillations of the flow itself like a global oscillation right some waves in this disk and so on some oscillation modes and this is what I will be talking now uh, this it's called disco seismology this uh, name is invited by professor bob wagoner and uh, you know you have now uh, seismology right about earth and you have helio seismology so there is sort of another seismology related to oscillations of accretion disk no yeah and of course yeah absolutely yeah 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 so, so uh, if you look at that, then there is like uh, the description, and now we are becoming a little bit mathematical. So, so basically, what you what you deal with is fluid description of the of the system. So, not like particles, but you have to solve fluid equations, which looks like this. And I write this equation in the Newtonian version because. Uh, it's easier to follow uh, and also somehow general relativity doesn't bring too much new things it's just you can repeat all the calculations I am showing here in GR it's uh, it's not complicated conceptually it's kind of just more work and the equations don't look so nice so so, so for for presentation purposes it's much better to show it like um like the newtonian version which is like talking about the same thing uh going through the same problems but with still simpler mathematics so basically you have to follow, you have to satisfy it like these equations like so continuity equation mass conservation momentum conservation which is so-called euler equation so you see that there is in addition to gravity there is a little pressure force which will be very important and uh, then you have some somehow related uh, the pressure and density so have your equation of state which looks like this and uh, of course there is like uh, just some note that uh, all the information acoustically propagates the speed of sound which is given from the equation of state just by this simple formula and uh, yeah yeah no yeah yeah, yeah. Yeah, 
and uh, if you calculate some oscillations of some structure so typically how you approach this problem is that you will take some stationary solution and then you perturb it so you say all the quantities slightly change and uh, subscribe the uh, the stationary solution and then you have uh, equations with the, uh, which is describing this small perturbation and uh, I start here with something very simple it's kind of I think the simplest model of accretion disk I think it's so simple that it's not even accreting the, this disk so basically you have just kind of fluid this is stationary and axisymmetric right so nothing depends on time and azimuth all the all the flow fluid is just in poor rotation so there is no even radial velocity right so no accretion but still it can be like the simplest model like zero other model of uh, of the accretion disk and uh, to make this uh, the life really simple i will consider only isothermal or polytropic but mostly isothermal equation of state which if you kind of look at that it follows from that the speed of sound is everywhere constant it's like over simple and i know that but already with this it's quite complicated so maybe there's no plasma there's no plasma no just gas yeah 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 yeah, yeah. no magnetic fields even no and uh, so if you do that and substitute your equations then basically uh, continuity equation is just kind of uh, satisfied by the symmetries uh, azimuthal equation as well so you end up with just radial and vertical equations which look like this and if you take just the vertical one then you have like uh, the competition between vertical gravity which is this vertical component of gravitational force and pressure force you have beautiful equation of state so you can easily integrate it and you will find out that vertically the profile uh, at the equatorial plane and then you have like exponential decreasing atmosphere of the disk right then of course if it's difficult to say what does it mean that the disk is thin so but you still have like some characteristic scale height which is given just by this formula and fin mean that this ratio is much less than the radius where i am right so this is like the simplest approach and then if you have this you substitute to the radial profile and then you see that there is competition between radial pressure force gravitational force and centrifugal force but the pressure radial pressure force is very small because the disk is very thin so the pressure itself doesn't make too much uh, contribution so mostly it's competition between these two terms and uh, and it follows that uh, of course the disk is in Keplerian rotation because you have just kind of uh, competition between centrifugal force and gravity and that's it and then I will pet that bit and I will not show all these equations but I will just mention how how one is proceeding right so uh, one writes the uh, it's it's good to kind of express perturbations of all quantities in terms of enthalpy perturbation it's kind of typical approach in fluid dynamics that uh, if you have especially like one parametric equation of state and like enthalpy is the quantity which is good to use and then if you write all these equations you can find out that actually they are separable so you can separate the radial dependence from the vertical one so then you assume that the that the enthalpy perturbation is in this form and then you have like a set of ordinary differential equations right and for the vertical the vertical equation is very simple and you can even solve it with some boundary conditions like on, on top and bottom of the disk and uh, and you will find out that actually vertical uh, like the vertical eigenfunction is just hermit polynomial which is also quite simple nothing special and then you end up also only with this radial dependence and because uh, depends on time and azimuth is kind of simple because it's axisymmetric and stationary the 
stationary uh, situation. So if you take this, substitute to the radial equation, then you end up finally with single equation, which describes your postulation. Is it a little bit clear uh, what what we are doing? Fine. And uh, and if you look at that and you remember that actually we are talking about a uh, thin accretion disk, then you can kind of estimate what is magnitude of different terms, and you find out that actually in uh, in the case of thin disk, if you are not close to some special radii, which I will be talking about very soon, uh, you have basically competition only between these two terms. And then you can approach the situation and make uh, like simple WKB approximation just to find out like what is the typical wave number. So you substitute uh, like exponential dependence on radius. And at the end, you will end up with algebraic equation, which is called uh, dispersion relation. And dispersion relation in the case of thin disk looks like this. So there is this k, which is radial wave vector, and there is this omega tilde, which is this strange combinations of omega uh, frequency of oscillation minus azimuthal wave number of the, uh, like m equals zero is axisymmetric mode m equal one is like one arm mode m equal two 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 arm mode times the orbital frequency of the flow so this will be very important quantity very soon and then there are some combinations of epicyclic frequencies so it looks like this quite simple formula and then of course you can ask okay but when these waves can propagate and you they can propagate only when k square is positive. When k square is negative, it means that the perturbation is changing uh, exponentially. Either it's exponentially decreasing or exponentially increasing. So the wave propagation regions are given by positive k square, right? So you have this, and then you ask where it happens. And here are just some examples. So uh, so in the case. Uh, of so-called p moles when n this is the uh, vertical wave number right and m which is means the azimuthal wave number is equal to zero so basically you, we have no vertical structure and no azimuthal structure so they are axisymmetric modes on all azimuth they, they uh, behave the same way and uh, there is no, no vertical structure and then of course you see that this uh, uh, these oscillations can propagate only like above the radial epicyclic frequency so radial epicyclic frequency look like this so so basically the waves can propagate here here, here but here not right so in principle if you would put some reflective boundary here at the inner edge, which is a questionable, but suppose that some wave can kind of reflect at the inner edge of the disk, where the disk is start, uh, suddenly start to plunge in, then you can trap some mode. Right? Simply you have to, you have two boundary conditions here and here, and then you have only distinct frequencies where uh, the waves can be. So, so this is uh, called P mode. Here is kind of typical velocity field, how it looks like. So you see that it's really kind of uh, uh, longitudinal, longitudinal uh, waves, right? So it looks like it is. There is no vertical structure, so basically only uh, horizontal displacement and uh, uh, like making like denser and less dense. So it's really like sound wave, right? Basically, what you know. You know, sound PS is coming by experiments or theoretically it's coming. Uh, yeah. It's free parameter, yeah. Basically, it's uh, it, like you have this PS uh, or no, I don't, like the thickness of the disk over radius is basically CS over. R omega, right? So really, it, it's relating to it's related to to the thickness of the disk. If, 
It's for stationary. Yeah, absolutely. All this quantity is for stationary. Yeah. So if you have very thin disk, then speed of sound is much less compared to orbital velocity. Right. So there you have really very supersonic rotation, basically. But if you have thicker disk, then of course uh, the speed of sound depends really on um, on this. Right, so, so basically these are the frequencies of these trapped oscillations here. So you see that there are these things like uh, numbered by this J and and so on. But there is a question whether you can reflect the wave at the inner edge, which you don't know. Yeah, it's yeah. Actually, in this simple model, torque is everywhere zero, right? Because there is no viscosity. So even at the inner edge, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, I will talk about that later. So, so if you have access to the oscillations, G mods. So now is the same, but n is greater than zero. So it means that there is some vertical structure, and uh, so then if you substitute to this uh, to this dispersion relation, it looks like this, and you can satisfy this. Like now, it depends a lot, and basically what is happening that these modes can propagate either below the radial epicyclic frequency or some multiple of uh, the vertical frequency. So typical propagation diagram looks like this. These modes can propagate here and here. The vertical structure is more complicated. There is already some vertical displacement. So basically these modes, uh, like all the fluid elements, are following some kind of ellipse, right? So it's kind of deep water oscillation, something like this. And um, so it looks like this. And what is the very kind of nice fact about these modes is that actually, since this is forbidden region for them, you can trap them just below the maximum of the radial epicyclic frequency, right? You don't need any reflective boundary, nothing. They, if they are just trapped basically by strong gravity, by the fact that the radial epicyclic frequency is not monotonic. So, so, so that was very strong candidate for this QPO because, like, like this frequency is given just by, just by mass of the black hole, right, or spin of the black hole, something what is not changing. Once you have like set your proper set the property of your black hole, then you have this curve and then it depends on the sound speed, of course, how much wavelength you can put here, but definitely it will be not very far away from this maximum, the first overtones and so on. So then the, the space time. So this was very nice uh candidate for qpos this was first kind of discovered by okazaki kato and fukue quite long time ago you can even find some uh, analytic approximation and so on and people were of course trying to uh find out whether how much they actually corresponds to observations so there is one attempt uh there is uh, 67 hertz oscillation in one very famous uh, black hole source, which is having this name, and uh, and uh, so here is kind of the you see this is like uh, power spectra at different times, at different days. But either you see uh, this QPO very weak or not uh, stronger, but you see them all the time at the same frequency. And uh, if you apply this model, then you see that actually uh, for spin, which is kind of assumed in this in these sources, you see quite good agreement. But it's just this 67 hertz, and there are more frequencies, right? So it doesn't explain anything and everything, but but it's kind of nice uh, nice fact about these modes. Uh, these G modes are also observed in numerical simulations. So there is one uh, simulation of Wupendra Misra. Uh, quite recent still, and uh, so, so they observed like the disk, it's turbulent, so there is all it's plasma, so, so there is even like magnetic fields and everything. 
uh, magnetohydrodynamic turbulence. Uh, but what they do is basically they just kind of wait till the more or less steady state of this uh, of this flow which they simulate and then they do the power spectra in different radii right so this is what you see here so there are different radii there are different frequencies and colors are basically the value of the power spectrum so basically if if, um, if it is more and it's, uh, at these frequencies and you see that uh, what they say actually what they claim is that this here you have a lot of variability just uh, below the radial anticyclic frequency so they say that actually this probably is really they observe the gmod here is kind of the detail so yeah it's not completely trapped it goes a little bit farther away but more or less it's kind of uh, good uh non-axisymmetric oscillations and i don't know how much time i have five minutes okay so i will just because this is nice and it just shows you how complicated things can be even they are so simple and uh, i will not go too much detail but in the case of axisymmetric oscillations so again i'm showing this diagram radius frequency then uh, there is this important quantity, this omega tilt, which is like omega minus omega. If you kind of think about that, what does it mean? It's the frequency of the perturbation of the wave, which you would observe if you would move with the fluid, right? So there is this Doppler effect, basically. Right? If you move, uh, observe the wave, which is, so you observe different frequency and you observe this frequency. An important thing is that there are uh, two different like regions very close to the center. Usually, the this uh, commoving frequency is negative, far away it's positive because the rotation is very slow there, right? So you observe basically the same as if you are not rotating. And at some radius, uh, the frequent uh, the wave. Uh, is propagating together with the flow, right? So azimuthally. So basically, you have this. So this is important. One important thing. The other important thing, which I will not prove, but it is uh, it is not difficult. It's just complicated, but uh, straight forward. That if you calculate what is the energy of the of the oscillation, right? Then uh, you will find out that it can be either negative or positive what does it mean because your stationary flow already has some energy right it's rotating so at least it has this kinetic energy and so on so so you can imagine perturbation which is kind of decreasing this energy or increasing this energy and if it is increasing this energy i call it like positive energy perturbation if it is decreasing this energy i call it negative and you can find out quite simple uh, simple result that actually if the wave is kind of going faster than the fluid which is corresponding to this omega tilde positive then you are increasing the energy and if it is like lacking lagging behind the fluid it has negative energy and it's decreasing the energy of the base where, um, which is called corrotation where the wave is kind of moving azimuthally with the same pace speed like the fluid itself and uh, it hit it happened, for example, in non-asymmetric G mod, which looks like this. So at some point you have this. And what is actually happening, which I did like previously, then you see that it happens where this omega tilde becomes zero. So suddenly this term will be very important. And you have somehow deal with this singularity. And what you 
will do or what we would find out is actually that uh, what is happening is like the waves are absorbed at this so this is like numerical simulation numerical solution of this equation so initially i put like some wave and you, here is the correlation and you see that the wave is kind of not propagating further this is really absorbed at this right okay i will skip this and uh, there is another interesting thing which is related to p more so they, they looks like this so again they can propagate here here is forbidden here they can propagate here is the like uh, border between the positive and negative energy waves and you may find out that actually it may trap some oscillations here but because in, inside the correlation it has negative energy but of course some wave can tunnel uh, over this potential barrier here and here propagate outward so here the same perturbation will have positive energy so you and that's the main point here if you would have like some perturbation here which has negative energy but some part goes out carrying out positive energy right so what will happen no, to kind of satisfy energy conservation this part should have more and more negative energy right because you are kind of removing positive energy from the negative energy right so this is this leads to instability obviously right so this the amplitude of this is increasing and increasing it's somehow some uh it's very common situation in physics so for example we have this over reflection uh, or so-called Penrose process right so for example you know this Penrose process you you have uh, ergosphere in the ergosphere you can some particles can have negative energy right so you take the particle kind of split it to two parts the part one part has negative energy black hole eat this like and the positive energy goes away and suddenly it has more energy than it had before right the same time, positive energy so this has to be more and more negative right and uh, then it can be much more complex but i will probably <laughs> not talk anymore this is kind of main uh, i wanted just to illustrate that actually so simple thing like uh, like uh, it's not even accretion disk right it's just this kind of very simple just the fact that it's rotating makes a lot of positive and negative energy waves okay so thank you very much <laughs> can i ask a question i was always puzzled why actually neutron star uh, sources have much stronger uh, QPO so, phenomenon. Uh, Ojana, can you hear us now? Now I can hear you, yes. And uh, during the lecture, Yiji, you talked about uh, uh, wave energy. So I wonder whether you can compare the wave energy between the, the, the radius implied by QPO phenomenon uh, in the inwards in the case of a black hole, with the same situation when you have a neutron star inside and there the energy is factor at least three higher. So maybe that would explain why a QPO in neutron stars are stronger. Thank you. Uh, here the first part, I'm sorry, but the second was interesting. Can you repeat the question? There was a technical problem. So we have heard the last part of the question, but not the beginning. Okay, so I, I wanted to ask if we can compare uh, cases with black holes, with cases with neutron stars, using this those uh, uh, wave energy plots, because in the case of neutron star you just have to add whatever was dissipated at the boundary layer and if that participates in the in the qpo phenomenon then qpo will be stronger and you have actually a quantitative uh, prediction of that 
I don't, uh, I, I still don't know if I follow completely, but that's true that um, a lot of people are saying that actually in the case of new drug, uh, the, the radiation which is modulated by particles are originating not in the disk, but in the boundary layers. Right? So we have like accretion disk, and then immediately before it starts, it falls from the start, it's the uh, so called boundary layer, which is very kind of radiating because most of the energy is dissipated there. And then uh, the question is uh, like the my answer to this would be kind of related to uh, very old time observation by Bodan Pachinsky, who actually also kind of anticipated already that it would be a right? So we would have like some standing more. And the uh, fact that the acquisition laser we also modulated the frequency. And therefore, like the info to the boundary layer will be modulated with the same frequency. And you expect that uh, uh, the, the radiation from the boundary layer will be modulated, right? Because you are such the input of the matter there with this frequency. So basically, the because of this modulation of This communication can be also difficult. Yeah, but I think I can guess what you what you wanted to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Much. <laughs> uh, so, Wojtek, last quick question, please. Yeah, I don't know what it's working, but thank you very much for the next thing. Pedagogical touch that we have to achieve. But I'm, I'm left with confusion, and then you can help me. Yeah. So, as far as I understood, you simply well, there are two models, uh, but the second one that was a bit more successful still didn't include any uh, uh, discovery. It was all in this in this case. Yeah. Uh, model. yeah. So, now, should I understand that because this one already predicted something that was shown in the real black hole, that the real the, the action disk in our black holes are viscous, or viscous doesn't play a role? Because I would expect maybe that because of the like, partition uh, principle, they should be dampening on those situations because of viscosity. So, could you comment on that? Yeah, actually, in some viscous, it is too well, right? And that's my goal of travel. So, uh, as far as I know, because uh, there are some results already from simulation. So, for example, people are simulating this with this traditional alpha viscosity. Right? This could be my the and so on. And, and uh, mostly all the modes provide this. I think uh, because either you can have dumping, but uh, it was also shown uh, by Soji Kato, I don't know, 20 years ago, perhaps. That there is uh, the viscosity can also like uh, enhance the operation right? because suddenly, like the viscous force goes really exactly in phase where it is kind of needed. Uh, but uh, when there is turbulence and it start to be very complicated, and I think numerical simulations show that like G motor is rather dark. Okay, so we have global simulation because there's also like the lots of like uh, problems by itself, right? But uh, and uh, but you can still have like HP more. Okay, yeah, okay. yeah, I'm sorry, yeah, thank you. Yeah, I mean, so it's like the speaker, yeah.